Hi, AP Stats. Hope you guys are having a great day. Um, today is um, a review video. So this is um, a chapter four review from the Practice of Statistics, which is about experimental design. Um, so that's what we're doing today. Just a brief review. I'll probably go over some vocab. Um, and just like things that just happen to pop up. Um, I do have the test in front of me, so I'm just kind of like looking at that, looking at the things we need to review, so you're prepared for the test. So um, let's let's get started. Okay, so the three main things that we covered in this chapter was how to experiment well, how to do observational studies and sample well, um, and then bad things that can happen when you don't do them well. Um, so we're going to start with the observational studies because that's kind of where we started uh, in the book. Um, but Basically, with observational studies, we talked about um, what an explanatory variable was, what a response variable was. Okay, so explanatory variable is the x variable. It explains the response, which is y. Um, and then we also talked about like types of random sampling. So um, we started with the simple random sample, which has um, there's two situations for. Um, that are important to remember about simple random samples. One is that um, every individual has the same chance of being selected and every sample of a specific size, like of size 20, has the same chance of being selected. So I could, so like just happen by random chance, to select 20 people who all have the same qualities or like have the same hair color or are the same gender. Um, uh, but so that's important to remember about a simple random sample. Remember the ways that you can take a simple random sample is like you can number everybody from 1 to n um, and use a random number generator to assign them to groups um, or you can um, put everybody's name on an equal size sheet of paper, put them in a hat, mix well, and then pull out however many you need for your sample. Um, you could use a random number table in which case you have to label like if there's a hundred people, like let's say there's 200 people, you have to label people as 001 to um, 200, okay? Because you have to have the same likelihood of each individual being selected. Um, so it's not one to 200, but that's only for random number tables, not random number generators, because the random number generators, um, like they understand the difference between one and 200, and they also know that you know, give everything the same chance uh, of being selected. So, um, but you will have to be able to read um, and understand a, um, a random number table. So you would need to be able to make a selection um, from a, a random number table. So make sure you can do that. Next was the stratified random sample. Um, and that's the one where you split your experimental units or your subjects into um, categories based on a certain trait. Um, so you you intentionally group them by something that they have in common. Um, and that's not where the randomness comes in. The randomness comes in um, by randomly selecting individuals within that group um, with that specific trait for your sample. And then you do it for the next trait. Um, and basically what you end up with is uh, a sample that has all of the different traits in it that maybe you're interested in studying or interested in having in the study. Um, so for example, say you have M&Ms and you split them up into their colors, um, your colors would be your strata. Um, and then within that, um, within each group, you randomly select a couple, maybe it's like two or three um, of the pieces to be in your sample. So maybe you select this one, and this one, and this one, and then this one, and this one, and then, you know, so these are randomly selected. Um, you know, obviously it's not random because I'm just choosing them um, in a scattered manner, but um, then all of those that I selected are in your sample, okay? So that would be a stratified random sample, different than a cluster sample. Okay, so then you have um, the cluster sample, which is basically like taking handfuls of M&Ms and not separating them by something, um, by color, and um, 
having like different clusters that are all like semi-representative of the population. Um, and so um, in this case, like I have four different clusters, one, two, three, four. Um, and then I would use a random number generator or something to select one or two or maybe a few of the clusters. So I happen to, you know, use my random number generator and I happen to pick one and four. Um, and then those, all of the M&Ms that are in those two clusters are in my sample. So it's just a different way of sampling. Typically, it's not used as often as um, like stratified and simple random sample, but it's important to know it exists and how it works. And last but not least, we have the systematic sample. Actually, it is kind of least. We don't really use it very often. Um, basically, you select, like for example, you select every seventh person who walks into Henderson in the morning to be in the sample. Uh, typically, this number is randomly selected, um, but yeah, it's not used very often, but you should at least know the term. Uh, but typically, you'll see more, more of the stratified and simple random samples. So, uh, now we have our bad things, bad things that can happen. So, um, the first thing is bias, um, and bias can come from all sorts of different things, um, one of which might be, like, wording of a question. Um, we talked about a lot of these of examples, um, but the way that you word a question can strongly affect the results. Um, you can also get it from voluntary response, so if you... Um, put a poll online and uh, people voluntarily respond to it, you will typically only get, or most often get, the really, really strong uh, perspectives, the strong opinions, um, all the people who feel strongly for or against what you're asking them about. Um, convenience samples can also result in bias. Um, they are not ideal. <laughs> um, that's just like standing outside of the ice cream shop and saying, hey, do you like ice cream? And you tend to get really biased results from that as well. Um, and then the last thing is the question order. We didn't talk a ton about this, um, but, but it's like that question about, you know, if you ask a question that reminds somebody of something that you're curious about in the next question or that you ask in the next question, you can change how they re respond to it. So, so that's also um, a way you can get biased results. Okay, some other things that could be problems are just errors um, in your sampling methods. So uh, these may not be intentional, but, um, and I guess technically like the wording could also be an error in your sampling as well. Um, but uh, under coverage, which is when you like miss an entire group of people just by the way that you're surveying or the way that you're um, taking a sample. Um, Non-response is when people when you like request somebody respond to a survey and they choose not to. Um, and then a uh, response bias is like the person who is responding either lies because they don't want to tell you the truth or because they hate taking surveys and they want you to get out of their face, um, whatever it may be. Um, but they, they don't give you the full truth um, for whatever reason. Um, and so that would be response bias. Okay, and last but not least are the experiments. Um, so experiments, you can also have an explanatory and response variable. I noticed that I put that in observational studies, but like that's generally for the entire chapter um, and the rest of the year. Um, you also might have lurking or compounding variables. Um, lurking variables uh, could become compounding variables. Um, and basically confounding is... Um, what happens when you think that one thing causes another, but it's actually something else that's that's happening that you're not thinking about. Um, and so, like, you might make a cause and effect conclusion, um, like that smoking causes lung cancer, but it turns out it's not actually smoking. It's the, you know, it's something, I don't know, it's the paper that the cigarettes are rolled in. I don't know. Um, obviously, smoking does cause lung cancer don't listen to that, but you know, you get the idea. Um, so uh, the treatment, oh, I heard a really interesting thing on um, NPR recently that was about fracking, um, and this guy who was doing an experiment on whether or not fracking caused 
um, health problems. And so he like went to a town that had just started, fr like had been doing, you know, had been involved for a long time. Um, and as he was like talking to people, like they had higher issues of, with, of asthma, um, higher rates of um, a lot of different like lung problems. Um, and while he was staying there, what he realized is uh, there were a ton of trucks, um, semi-trucks, uh, all sorts of big, big diesel trucks um, that were coming in to carry everything that they needed to the town and away from the town for the fracking. Um, and so what he's proposing is perhaps, rather than the fracking being the problem, that it might actually be like the exhaust in the air from the trucks that come along with the fracking. So that's an example of an actual confounding variable. Well, I guess you don't know if it's actually confounding, but he's trying to figure out whether or not it is. So anyways, fun fact. Um, listen to NPR, it's super cool. Um, you learn lots of new things and they talk about stats a lot, yay. Um, okay, so then uh, experiments always have a treatment that's imposed. So if I ever ask you like, is this a treatment or an observational study? check to see if there's a treatment. If there's a treatment, it's an experiment. If there's no treatment, it's an observational study. Then you have the three principles of experimental design. Control, replication, and randomization. Um, yeah. The things that are, um, that, like, you know, more details, are like, how do you randomize? Um, and for experiments, you would not take a simple random sample for an experiment um, because most of the time you have volunteers for experiments. But you could have a completely randomized design. In order to get randomness, you could have a completely randomized design, which is like put all the names in a hat and pick one to go to one group and one to go to the next group and one to go to the next group. Um, a randomized block design, which is similar to a stratified random sample um, in the sense that you separate the experimental units or the subjects by a specific trait, um, like sex or gender, um, or hair color, or eye color, or blood pressure. Um, and then you do the experiment within each block. Um, and then the matched pairs design is when you have, like, you, the best matched pairs design is to, like, pair somebody with themselves um, and, like, compare a before and after type of situation. Um, but you might be able to do it with two subjects um, that are really, really similar. That's like the pig problem that I did um, in one of the videos where I was talking about matched pairs design. Um, so those are, this is like experiment vocabulary. This is like observational study and sampling vocabulary. Bad thing that can happen with experiments is like the placebo effect. So that's why you need to have a control group um, so that you can control for that. Um, placebo effect is basically when you react to a pill just because you think you're taking a pill and not because there's actually anything in it. Um, so this is real, it happens, the mind is a crazy powerful thing, and so that's why you need to control your experiments. Um, and the last thing that we talked about was the scope of inference and what are you allowed to conclude from what. So remember if you have random sampling, you can uh, infer um, like make generalizations about a larger population. And if you have random assignment of treatments, um, you can infer cause and effect. Um, and so if you have both random sampling and random assignment, or random selection and random assignment, you can infer cause and effect for a larger population. Um, but that doesn't happen very often, so, well, you gotta, you can only conclude what you can conclude. If you conclude something different, then you're doing bad stats. And I think that's pretty much it. Um, if you want to, like, I would recommend trying the examples from the um, from the book. There's some really good review problems in there and a practice test. Uh, but yeah, that's about that's that's all we did in chapter four. Cool. Good luck studying. <laughs>